Good morning, everyone. It's estimated that at least 39 million Americans live with migraine attacks. That's according to the American Migraine Foundation. And health experts say extremely hot weather can not only make these painful headaches happen more often, but can also cause them to be more severe. Mandy Gaither has more on how to manage migraines in the heat. Changes in barometric pressure, extremely high temperatures, and the threat of dehydration. Put that all together and patients who suffer from migraines will suddenly see an increase in headache or migraine frequency during these events. Dr. Ahmad Estamalik with Cleveland Clinic says those with constant chronic migraines will most likely require daily medication, injections, or a procedure. But for those who get them less frequently, you can manage migraines by knowing your triggers and avoiding them. And stay hydrated, Estamalik says that alone may eliminate the possibility of a migraine. Finally, turn to rescue medicine as soon as symptoms start, but he cautions not to take those medications too many times a week. We usually recommend no more than two to three times, just because for those patients who have migraines, they run the risk of developing what we call rebound headaches if they use abortive medications too often. And if you're struggling with heat-related migraines, Estamolic says to seek care. The, the disorder, despite being very, very prevalent, remains uh, underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and often undertreated as well. So again, patients don't need to suffer. Talk to your healthcare provider, your neurologist, or your headache specialist, because there's a lot out there that can make a difference. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. And there are already a number of different types of medications available to treat migraines, including several kinds of nasal sprays. Well, much of the country is in the midst of a heat wave. As Dania Bacchus tells us, extreme summer temperatures are not only dangerous for our bodies, but also for our vehicles. The summer sun can beat down on our cars and lead to a breakdown. That's why it's important to make sure engine oil and other fluids are full, including coolant, which prevents overheating. The cooling system for the car is crucial. Crucial. Probably equally as important as the engine oil. Dave Skane from AAA says keeping tires properly inflated is also crucial. Underinflated tires concentrate pressure on the inner and outer edge of the tire, which causes a heat buildup here. And when you're driving in hot climates, that heat buildup on the corners of the tire, on the edges of the tire by the sidewall, can lead to sudden blowouts and tire failure. In the heat, a car's interior can reach extreme temperatures and damage some devices like cell phones. Vinyl and leather seats can also get very hot. If you've got a hot interior and you have access to a towel or something you can lay over your seat to keep it a little cool so when you get in it and sit down, you're not sitting on a blazing hot seat, that'll be helpful for driver comfort. Skein suggests keeping an emergency kit in your vehicle with water, jumper cables, first aid supplies, and a portable battery charger for devices. When your car has a problem and you're stranded, a lot of times you can't run the engine so you can't charge your phone. Simple steps that can help drivers stay safe in the summer and year round. Donya back is CBS News, Los Angeles. All right, the race to develop a flying taxi is a high stakes competition with startups around the globe. But a German company says its all electric version will just not will not just help commuters, but the environment as well. Ian Lee brings us that story. German company Lilium says the sky's the limit with their experimental jet, billed as the first of its kind, lifting off vertically as it took to the skies in Spain this week. It's a completely battery powered, fully electric, vertical takeoff and landing jet airplane. The electric taxi can carry up to six passengers and a pilot, and it's built to handle extreme heat while not contributing to a warming planet. These airplanes are meant to help avoid the climate change. This is why they are fully battery powered. The company claims it'll provide quicker but still affordable regional trips, like New York to Philadelphia in around an hour, compared to a longer journey by car or train. Lilium is competing with rival startups to get the world's first flying taxi off the ground. Experts predict they could swarm our skies by the end of the decade, but it's really up to you. It really is linked to whether people want to use the products and services, you know, if there's demand from people. With plans to go global next year, creators hope demand will be sky high. Ian Lee, CBS News. Just ahead, young adults are making choices to not become parents. We'll have that story when mid-morning returns. 
A growing number of millennial and Gen Z women are choosing not to become parents. Naomi Ruckham explains the many factors leading to that decision, why the shift is happening now. Cecile Palacios is in a committed relationship, has a successful fitness career, and at age 40 does not plan to have children. We as women are able to live fuller lives in general, and I think that that's why the child-free movement is happening. Social media topics like childless by choice, motherhood is not for everyone, are getting lots of likes from like-minded people. A 2021 Pew Research Center survey shows Palacios is not alone. 44% of non-parents ages 18 to 49 say it is not too likely or not likely at all that they will have children someday, up seven percentage points from 2018 survey. Reasons for not having children range from medical and financial to concerns about the state of the world and the environment, and most simply say they just don't want to. No one can afford kids. That's a big thing. Affording children is really, really hard. Experts say choosing not to have children is becoming more socially accepted, in part because the family makeup is changing. Dr. Paula England is Dean of Social Science at NYU Abu Dhabi. For decades and decades, there was an assumption that to be an adult um, in our culture, you had to be married and you had to have kids. And I think that assumption is kind of falling away. It's a welcome shift for many Gen Z and millennial women like Palacios. Even though I've seen wonderful examples of motherhood, I think not enough space is held for there being more than one kind of definition of a woman. Palacios has carved out her own space and hopes every woman can choose theirs. Naomi Ruckham, CBS News. And a growing number, oh, pardon me, that's not the right thing. Let me get to the right thing here. All right, recent <laughs> Census Bureau data also found that as of 2021, 25% of 40-year-olds in the U.S. had never married, and that is up from 2010. Now, Art Imitates Life, a look at prison relief program that trains inmates to fight fires. That story ahead on Mid-Morning. Welcome back. Washington Ridge Camp is one of the many conservation camps across the state of California, essentially allowing members of the correctional facilities and mates to become firefighters that you see along the lines during fire season. It's a program that is still continuing to grow and is one of that one that proponents say is one of the most effective prison reform programs the state has to offer. Andrew Hubner has that story. Michael McCray is part of crew four at Washington Ridge Camp. <laughs> Crew is his team, and fighting fires is their game. We're Super Bowl champs, you know what I mean? We, we get out there and we get it done. Yeah. You know, we got our quarterbacks, we got our wide receivers, we got our running backs, and we got the line. Yeah. You know, we hold down the line and we make sure that our team stays strong. But Mike isn't a normal civilian firefighter. Going on, um, well, it's probably about, say, eight, eight years of some change now. He's currently in the correctional system. First degree burglary, residential. And yet, Fire not scouting his size death. here he is along with others like him, learning to be a firefighter. Do you consider this prison reform? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Fred Money has worked on these programs for over a decade. We have no issues in camp treating these guys with the respect of, of a firefighter. Um, that's what they are. McCray and others live on camp, have access to wood shops, games, and family can visit for picnics and trips. I learned more here, just not uh, as a firefighter, uh, but just more as a as a person. Inmates are responsible for every corner of camp. I can walk outside that door right there and just to be able to go to the backyard and, you know, inhale, exhale, and get a, a, fre a breath of fresh air. And there's pride in every inch of cleanliness and order. It's great. It's just to be able to be out and uh, be in the wilderness and, uh, you know, get out and be a firefighter and uh, help families and, and, you know, save lives. As new Senate bills and CDCR initiatives help re-entry and try to give opportunities to those putting in the work. Do I think guys that have had some hard knocks and um, aren't right now camp eligible could profit from this um, program? Absolutely. To continue to help build a path forward. That every man deserves a chance to be able to better herself, to better his life, you know, to be able to want to uh, come to places like this and um, excel in their life. 
And what is important that we've heard from everyone, between the inmates to the guards, members of CDCR, is that they say this bridges the gap and adds some humanity in both ways, from guards to inmates and inmates to guards, to help for eventual re-entry back into society. And if the story sounds familiar, you may have watched the CBS drama Fire Country. Fire Country follows the story of professional firefighters and that of the prison release program at the fictional Cal Fire. Fire Country airs Fridays at 8 here on WCBI. Well, conservation groups across the country are taking new approaches to safeguard temporary waterways in their backyards that are created by snow melts and heavy rain. The latest push follows the Supreme Court's recent decision to strip away federal protections from some wetlands, leaving them at risk for pollution. Skylar Henry has more on that. Keeping areas like these protected recently became murkier for Colin O'Meara. Over the last 20, 30 years, we tried to restore a lot of habitat here, had some kind of responsible redevelopment on the other side. He's the CEO and executive director of the National Wildlife Federation and says this Delaware wetland is now more exposed following a May Supreme Court ruling narrowing regulations. These are some of the most important systems to protect our health, protect us from flooding, protect us for, for water quality, and they're all at risk right now. The Sackett versus EPA decision makes it harder for the federal government to police water pollution in isolated wetlands, the same wetlands that were once covered under the Clean Water Act. The 5-4 vote said that wetlands can only be regulated if they have continuous surface connections. Abby Tierna, who lives in Florida, worries about the more than 31 percent of wetlands in that state that don't meet that criteria. If we want clean water, that's almost impossible in the state of Florida without recognizing the contribution of wetlands. Her Suncoast Waterkeeper nonprofit has gone after local municipalities for irresponsibly disposing of waste prior to the ruling. She says forcing new ordinances on the local and state level helps push back against land development interests. Just because you can't see the connection doesn't mean the connection doesn't exist. There's a large body of research right now that does show the connection via groundwater, uh, animals, energy, nutrient transfers. These are the systems that are going to protect us from, from climate change, and if we don't protect them now, we're going to regret it later. O'Meara says he's focused on coordinated state protections, with hopes of finding a consensus soon. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Wilmington, Delaware. Well, there are extraordinary efforts being undertaken to bring back the once nearly extinct Mexican gray wolf to America's Southwest, but it's not without controversy as ranchers fear their livelihoods are being threatened with more of their cattle being killed. Chris Van Cleve looks at the tensions that come with the growing wolf population. The race to save an endangered species has five newborn Mexican wolf pups on a nearly 2,500 mile journey. Precious cargo first. From captivity in New York to New Mexico and the wild. Mm. Veterinarian Susan Dix. Time is trauma, and the very best place for a wolf pup to be is with a mother. The Mexican wolf, or lobo, was once plentiful in the Southwest until it was hunted nearly to extinction. By the mid 1970s, there were just seven in existence. They are doing better and improving, but that's a fine line. Disease comes through, something happens, they could be lost. There are now about 250 back in the wild, but a lack of genetic diversity <laughs> makes rehoming pups from captivity necessary. Is this wolf country? Yes, it is. At Barbara Marks Family Ranch in Blue, Arizona, wolves were a threat back in 1891, and she says they're targeting her calves again now. The numbers have increased dramatically, so they have become more of an issue and more of a year-round issue. Wildlife officials estimate about 100 cattle a year are lost to Mexican wolves. Marks opposed releasing them into the nearby national forest, but also knows her new neighbors are here to stay. So this is a baby Mexican wolf. He's about 10 days old and very soon is going to meet his new mom in the wild. But to get there required hiking through miles of difficult and prickly terrain to reach the wolf den. The wild pups are pulled out, given a health screening, and introduced to their new siblings. We've got them all mixed together, all the puppies smelling the same, and we put microchips in both and put them back in the den. Uh, when we walk away from it, uh, the mom will come back. It would seem like to me that if you just sort of increased the size of a litter, that the wolf would notice. You know, we don't think they can count, but they will care for pups, whether or not they're theirs. 
an endangered symbol of the Old West seeking a new life. For Eye on America, Chris Van Cleve, Reserve, New Mexico. Coming up, Barbie is trending and it is not just the movie. We'll show you next on Mid Morning. Welcome back everyone. The Environmental Protection Agency is proposing a new rule that would impose tough standards on lead and paint in older homes and schools. Christina Fan spoke to one homeowner in Newark, New Jersey, where officials gave details on the measure. When Jomo Rose first purchased his Newark home last year, possible lead contamination wasn't even on his radar. But shortly after moving in, he learned one of his youngest tenants, a two-year-old girl, had traces in her bloodstream. I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I got to do something because it's a poor this poor child. The city grants helped him pay for abatement, but nationwide, roughly 31 million homes have the same hazardous paint on their walls, according to the EPA. We know that no level of exposure to lead is good for our children. To eliminate the danger, the EPA introduced a groundbreaking proposal to lower its lead dust hazard level to anything greater than zero. Selecting Newark, a city that recently overcame a lead crisis in its water system as the backdrop for its announcement. I think reducing the, the hazard level to, to zero or just anything above zero is going to help drive more cleanups. It's going to protect more children. It's going to remove the paint from these walls. Lead-based paint was commonly used in homes before it was banned in 1978. Exposure has been proven to cause developmental delays, learning difficulties, and neurological damage. I can just imagine so many other people going through this, or so many people not even don't even know that they're exposed to lead. If finalized, the rule is expected to reduce the lead exposures of up to half a million children under the age of six per year. In Newark, New Jersey, Christina Fan, CBS News. Ahead of Friday's release of the movie Barbie, dozens of brands and retail retailers are catering to nostalgic adults, hoping they'll spend their extra cash on bright pink clothes and accessories to reconnecting with their childhood memories. Cole Higgins has a look at the brands looking to cash in big on this small, iconic doll. The business of Barbie is hot pink. This summer's blockbuster Barbie movie has retailers and brands rushing to cash in on the nostalgia. I'd say the world has turned pink. It's an incredibly important milestone for the brand. Retailers are hoping cautious consumers will dip into their discretionary spending to buy Barbie themed merch. More than 100 eager companies, including Aldo, Gap and Crocs, have signed deals with Mattel, the maker of the iconic doll, to create and sell Barbie themed clothing, shoes, accessories and countless other products, including the doll herself. I think I had 24. 24. And they were gone within like, I'd say within 48 hours. In New York City, Bloomingdale's flagship store, a pop-up shop looking more like Barbie's dream house. Meanwhile, Mattel is also hoping the new film will give Barbie sales a boost. After sales in the first quarter of this year fell 22% compared to the same quarter last year. We anticipate that this is going to be an unlock moment of huge monetization potential for the Barbie brand. It comes as higher grocery prices have impacted consumer spending. Retailers are hoping the pink craze this summer can chase away the inflation blues. Experts say it gives retailers a creative opportunity to lure in frugal shoppers into their store and convince them to spend their cash. I've seen, you know, more diversity, like in terms of dolls in general. So I will say there's an effort. For Consumer Watch, I'm Cole Higgins. More than 1,500 items belonging to 30-year Disney collector Joel McGee went on auction block in recently in Burbank, California. McGee is known as the Toy Scout and spent his life traveling the world to collect and sell vintage toys. His collection is believed to be the largest toy collection owned by one person. Elise Preston introduces us to the Toy Scout and takes a look at what's up for auction. 68 years ago, the so-called happiest place on earth opened its doors. And now, 1,500 pieces from a collection of 6,000 Disney theme park items are up for auction, all owned by one fan. I just call myself a temporary caretaker, and I'm glad that I can share this with everybody. Joel McGee is a self-described toy scout 
who's been collecting for 30 years. He's sharing the kingdom's magic with the world. I know, it sounds crazy, but I actually built an entire addition to my house to house this collection. <laughs> From animatronic tiki birds to possibly every park poster printed, and even this king's carriage from 1917. Walt would get into this car and drive it up and down Main Street. McGee has poured millions of dollars into his collection. He's hoping items like this precious pachyderm help bid soar past $10 million. Items never available before to the public, like these haunted mansion hitchhiking ghosts, conjured a winning bid of more than $400,000. But you don't need deep pockets. Souvenirs like pennants and hats will go for 50 bucks. It allows us as adults, if even for a moment, to revisit our childhood. Elise Preston, CBS News. And stay with us. We'll be right back to wrap things up. One of America's most celebrated crooners died last week. Tony Bennett passed away this morning, well, rather Friday morning at the age of 96. Bennett's career spanned seven decades, earning him 18 Grammy Awards. He performed to audiences in cities around the world. But he was I left my heart. San Francisco. And Tony Bennett left us lots of music to remember him by. That's all of our time. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great day.